Ladies and gentlemen, I pleased to invite you to the discussion on historical remembrance and the identity of the Baltic states and Finland experience in the 20th century and how do they affect us, us today. And my many thanks go to the distinguished panelists and uh, actually uh, to our moderator, Rita Zamkauskas, he will introduce all panelists. Uh, and the, I'll, they will share their insight on the multi-layer topic of historical remembrance and the impact of history on the identity of our nations. The topic has been analyzed and discussed by historians, politicians, members of civil society, and has become a part of common European Union identity discourse. Today's discussion will focus on Lithuania, uh, the other Baltic states and Finland, and their historical experience in the 20th century, which were crucial for the formation of our modern national states. However, I am convinced that the debate will bring us closer to common denominators for the European Union as all. Just like in the 20th century, by the Russian war on Ukraine, Europe has been again witnessing the violation of the fundamental rules of international coexistence. Witnesses once again how imperialist policies based on genocidal slogans lead to the war crimes and crimes against humanity. We are witnesses time when historical memory is instrumental and ruthlessly used to justify repression and the crime of totalitarianism the Ryan regimes. But does the history of 20th century teach us in the context of new challenges that we face in the 21st century? Can, can the continuity of totalitarian evil be stopped? Is the fostering of historical memory one of the ways to the resilience formation of our society? Let's look for answers together today. And finally, I would like to thank representation of the European Commission uh, that kindly agreed to host this event in this European Sally and uh, wishing you all the exciting discussion. Uh, now I would like to invite uh, host Ms. Maria Kokonen to say to some greetings word. Thank you so much. Good afternoon, ladies and gentlemen, dear Ambassador Katakevicius, illustrious panelists, and our moderator, uh, Rutis Etemkauskas, who will then um, run today's event. So first of all, welcome to this Europol, uh, to this most interesting discussion on historical remembrance and the identity of the Baltic States and Finland. As somebody who has devoted almost her entire professional life to the European project, I feel especially, especially honored to welcome you to the Europol today. I think that in today's context, you couldn't have chosen a more symbolical or a more appropriate venue for this, for this panel. So, um, you, you spoke already about the war and Ukraine, Ambassador. So for the European Union, the first priority is our support, of course, to Ukraine. And we are united in condemning Putin's aggression on Ukraine. And we will pro uh, provide support so long it takes to those seeking shelter. And we will help those looking for a safe way home. So we will continue offering a strong political, humanitarian, financial assistance and impose hard-hitting sanctions against Russia and those complicit in the war. But today's debate focuses on the 20th century and how its experiences affect us today. And when I got the invitation to pronounce a couple of welcome words here, 
Um, I immediately thought, of course, first, oh, today's war, like we all do, uh, I suppose, and how each of us and how the panelists will speak about it and how the war relates to us. And then I thought about the 20th century and its wars with this question in my mind, how somebody of my generation who was born after the war, the wars, should, uh, should not have personal experiences with it. And then I realized, actually, it is not true. Let me use a minute uh, to illustrate this with, my, uh, with a personal example. In Finland, so in the overall context after the wars of the 20th century, Finland has had to find place to live for nearly half a million Karelians, evacuees mainly, ev evacuees, mainly from Karelia. And this resettlement of, of almost 450,000 um, refugees was the biggest problem in the, in the post-war Finland immediately after the war reparations. So these Karelians, and more half of them, were farmers. And the policy was to place them in the areas that as closely as possible corresponded uh, to the pre-war conditions. And in practice, and I come now to, the, to, to the, how I personally related this, uh, 50,000 Karelians were settled in place in my region in northern Savo. And actually, the Finnish Settlement Museum is located in my home village, so the deepest village, in the deepest, the deepest Savo region. It is a special museum for representing and being the actual house, a typical house were given to frontline men and their families, to evacuees, uh, showing and reflecting as a museum nowadays to, to, to settlement the life of the immigrants and, and, um, and uh, integration in uh, the post-war post Finland. And in that little house, thousands of items have been preserved, including the correspondence of the inhabitants, two siblings, a brother, a sister and a brother, and their letters with their families and, 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 and reflecting and, and, and talking about the integration in a society far away from home and from their belongings. So somebody, me here today, pronouncing you these welcoming words here in the Europe uh, Hall, I have grown up in a small village in, uh, in a remote region from Helsinki, with a very thick dialect, but in an environment where you could hear in a village the, the, the local dialect, but the beautiful Karelian dialect, where the schoolmates would have their religious uh, lessons, orthodox lessons separately from us, at the same time we had our Lutheran lessons. So uh, as a European, I can say that the first sparks of being European and this identity and diversity, multiculturalism, I got in my home village. And, and this notion of diversity that uh, make me now so happy to welcome you here this, and, 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 and listening to your discussion, discussions today, they are of that diversity and identity, European identity, the local identity, the diversity that we are so proud in the European Union, the diversity in which we are united. So I wish you a very rich and rewarding discussion today. Thank you. Hear me? Oh, yes. Tervetuloa. Thank you for coming. Um, uh, we had the uh, welcoming speeches uh, by the representative of the European Commission here, uh, who is uh, 
the host of this event, and also from the ambassador of Lithuania, who is an organizer of this event. And now I am going to present our distinguished panelists. Uh, I cannot uh, decide about the order of how to do it, so it will be arbitrary. Um, so first of all, from Finland, Dr. Ulla Savolainen, and she is a researcher at the University of Helsinki, Department of Cultures, and she's a folklorist specializing in memory studies, oral history, and narrative research, with an interest in experiences and expressions related to sometimes forced migration, transnationality, and materiality. Ulla, please take your seat. Okay. The next person I would like to, to present is uh, Dr. Violeta Davolute, and she is from Lithuania. She is a uh, professor uh, at several uh, scientific institutions, and she is a political scientist, and she is active in fields like 20th century historical trauma uh, and cultural policy, cultural memory, commemoration, collective identity, nationalism, and post-colonialism. Violeta, please, take your seat. And the third person I would like to introduce is uh, Sophie Oxenen. And I don't think I should have tell you whom she, who she is. <laughs> Sophie, good to see you. Well, at least she is my favorite, one of my favorite writers. Okay, so uh, on with our uh, panel now. Uh, I think we are going to organize things uh, as follows. Uh, we will have some initial statements from our distinguished panelists. Then we will have some discussion. And of course, your questions and your remarks are most welcome. If you want to say something or ask something, please raise your hand and I will come up to you and bring a microphone, okay? So, who would like to start? Okay, Sophie? The floor is yours. First they came for the Latvians, and I did not speak out because I was not Latvian. Then they came for the Lithuanians, and I did not speak out because I was not a Lithuanian. Then they came for the Estonians, and I did not speak out because I was not Estonian. And then they came for Georgians, and I did not speak out as I was not a Georgian. Then they came for the Tatars on Crimean Peninsula, and I did not speak out because I was not a Tatar. And then they came for the Ukrainians. This Martin Niemöller's post-war statement is well known in the context of Hitler's Germany, and later on we've heard a lot of different versions about the same words. I have thought about these words, his lines, quite a lot over the past decade or 20 years. And um, I have a feeling that if the experience, historical experience and the memory of Baltic states and Eastern European countries had been in the cultural subconscious of Europe or Western Europe, then uh, the invasion uh, to Ukraine, Russia's invasion to Ukraine, would had had not taken the West by surprise. Um, so I, I'm I'm asked quite quite often. Um, um, well, before before the invasion, I was quite often asked about the gap between Eastern and Western European countries. Um, as I write about that gap, um, and and one of the most common questions has been that is there still a gap? Well, of course, the economical gap, sure, but I, I think one of the biggest gaps has been exactly the same. This question about 
uh, Eastern, Euc uh, Eastern European and Baltic states experience and uh, knowledge about the Eastern neighbor uh, and uh, our historical um, experience hasn't been knowledge. It has been considered something local, uh, just like, let's say, bronze soldier crisis was considered also by Finnish politicians as a regional um, and local crisis, not something that would concern the others. We've seen this same pattern repeated uh, time and time again, um, simply because uh, this historical memory hasn't been considered important enough. Thank you. Okay. So, um, as I was preparing for this for this meeting, the, which the topic was historical remembrance and identity in the Baltic states and Finland, um, I really kind of thought about about what what points to make. I'm not an expert in Finnish history, but um, the few things that came to my mind is the pioneering role of Finland in the promotion of women's equality. As you see, I'm not starting with the war, right? I am, I am thinking about other aspects that came to my mind, yeah? And, um, um, you know, that happened even before the Second World War. Second, the success of reforms to education, which give Finnish children the benefit of the best schools in the world today. So these are not the points of history that we Bolts have in common with the Finns, but I hope that we may learn from your experience uh, as we build our common European future. What we do share in terms of the past, unfortunately, is a common legacy of Soviet and Russian aggression. This is definitely a shared past, also occupation and imperialism. Moreover, the war in Ukraine that has already been mentioned, has brought the Russian threat and the plethora of problems that are also kind of united us, related to that, into focus. So the question um, we face now is how to react, how to counter, how to contain the threat to ensure that it does not endanger our community, our way of life, our values. There are many types of responses to the threat posed by Russia, military, police, trade, and immigration policy. But the focus of our discussion today is historical remembrance. And here, as a scholar who specializes uh, in the politics of memory, and here I have to mention I'm not a political scientist, I'm actually a cultural historian, I will argue that our actions should, not be, guide, should be guided rather uh, more by principle and less by knee-jerk reaction. When we are confronted with Russian propaganda, with a false and insidious narrative about our own country, sorry, history, we are tempted sometimes to respond by amplifying our own narratives and silencing false narratives. The problem with such mnemonic activism is that we risk falling into the trap of mirroring Russian and Soviet approaches to the past of censorship of punishing different ways of thinking. This leads to an erosion of critical thinking and self-censorship. This is clearly a path we do not wish to follow, I believe. A more complex question arises when we are confronted with the complacency of West Europeans towards the Russian threat, or the arrogance of great powers who look down on the predicament of smaller and more vulnerable states like ours. Is it important that we communicate our history? Yes. Should we seek to contribute to a common European understanding of the 20th century? Yes. Would I support a monument to the victims of communi communism in Brussels? Yes. But I have to confess, this, does not, this is not my first priority. Yes, I'm concerned with what Belgians or other Europeans think about my country, 
But it is far more important that my fellow citizens, especially the younger generation, develop a critical and broader understanding of their own history, of how their history compares and relates to the history of their neighbors, that they have the capacity to distinguish truth from falsehood, that they are not vulnerable to the tall tales and emotional manipulation of foreign or national propaganda. If we must have a policy towards remembrance at the national or European level, it should not be aimed at the creation of a single historical narrative. This is the path of propaganda, the path of Russia, and unfortunately of a few EU states that are moving towards this direction. Instead, our policy should have two pillars, I believe. The first is to encourage critical thinking and professional standards in the writing of history. I believe that we need healthy self-reflection, not only self-righteousness. The second pillar is to encourage greater engagement of the citizenry in the creation of historical narratives. Our society is diverse. Our history is inescapably plural. Our success and security depend on learning from many histories, not just one learning from each other. Thank you. Over to you, Ula. Thank you. Uh, can you hear me? Yes. So, um, my background is in, in cultural studies, and I have been specialized in cultural memory studies and oral history research. And in my work, I have been especially interested in various cultural and experienced aspects related to historical remembrance. And memory, I understand as a, a social and cultural phenomenon that is constructive by nature and essentially very selective process. So um, this also means that memory is always very political process. So which events and past we choose to remember and how always reflects broader views and goals about the society and people as well as their future. And the relationship with Russia or the Soviet Union has formatively shaped and informed mm -hmm. the 20th century memory culture in Finland, although in a partly different way than in Baltic countries. Arguably, the most central topics of historical remembrance in terms of identity formation in Finland have been the Winter War and the Continuation War uh, that Finland fought against the Soviet Union during the Second World War. The way in which these events have been remembered has, however, changed in time. State or grassroots perspectives to the war, as well as soldiers, civilians, women's and children's perspectives, have emerged at different times within the collective historical remembrance. And this reflects a broader uh, societal conditions. Moreover, not all aspects of these wars have become remembered in the same way. Even now, it is fair to ask whether, for example, the deep entanglement of the continuation war to the broader war efforts of Nazi Germany are part of popular memory in Finland. Or is this war still primarily understood as a distinct conflict between only just Finland and the Soviet Union? I think that it is important to recognize the fact that there is never only just one memory or just one memory culture, but several of them. The way in which the past is remembered depends on who remembers. The way in which individuals, families, different groups, academics, artists, institutions and states promote and perform remembrance may differ, differ a great deal from each other and be even in conflict with each other. But at the same time, individuals' memories never emerge in vacuum and institutionally promoted memories cannot exist without individuals which is why there is a constant interaction between different scales of remembrance and different agents of memory. For a scholar of memory, analysis of silences, omissions and forgetting are as important and interesting as are memories that are widely available and circulated. Analysis of silences and the logics, logics of selection may reveal interesting aspects into what we consider valuable and relevant in the present for the future. It may also open perspectives into processes of inclusion and exclusion, societal statuses of different groups and voices, and the power dynamics between different actors. 
Moreover, it is important to consider what kinds of pasts we tend to consider memorable. It is common that those events that somehow disrupt the flow of everyday life and have a clear beginning and end, such as war, wars, are easily memorable, whereas slower, more subtle, but more comprehensive and messier processes, such as colonialism, for example, are perhaps not as easily memorable. I see, however, that lately in Finland, for example, different minority perspectives that question the image of national unity, as well as Finland's implication to colonial projects, both locally and globally, have started to gain more traction as topics of historical remembrance and academic research. Memory researchers and theorists globally have also increasingly been criticizing the state's institutions and scholars' tendency to focus primarily on violent and repressive pasts, victimhood and trauma, instead of paying attention to more active and hopeful processes related to, for example, resistance and protest. But the time will tell what kinds of roles these will have in national or European memories and identities in the future. As a researcher of cultural memory, I first of all emphasize the importance of paying attention to different scales and different agents or actors of memory when we talk about historical remembrance. Indeed, historical memory is always multi-perspective and plural. What is basic knowledge of history in academic research might not be that among the general public, and how different individuals and communities remember the past can differ from each other significantly. Moreover, I would be cautious towards the attempts to force too strongly any kind of unified historical memory. I see rather that the tensions and multi-perspectivity of remembrance should not only be accepted, but also considered and harnessed as productive forces that can lead to societal good. And in these efforts, I see that not only national and international institutions or academic research, but different community initiatives, as well as art and literature, have a key role. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you, Ulla. Uh, before asking my first question to all of you, and every question will go to all of you, so it's, it's like that. Uh, let us be more democratic than we sometimes would want to. Um, and, uh, but uh, before doing that, I was looking at this um, identity of the Baltic states and Finland. And um, I, I wonder if everybody knows that, say, at the beginning of the 20th century, this region was considered Baltic states and Finland was included into the Baltic states. Later, things had changed. And um, uh, I was also wondering uh, why we do not have the fifth chair here for Latvian scholar, because Estonia is a little bit represented here, at least. <laughs> we have it. it okay, <laughs> where is she? Where is he? Good to see you. So maybe you would want to join us. Okay. Okay. So now, 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 I'm I'm okay with that. <laughs> And the question is, because what I was trying to say, I was looking for common grounds, of course. So in your opinion, uh, what do we really share today? I mean, the, the Baltics and Finland, or the Baltics without Finland, what do we share? What are common grounds? Where we, can we start talking from? Compared to what? <laughs> I mean, it's easy to say why we are, uh, you know, Balts or, or Finns or Nordic people or Europeans if we compare ourselves to Russia. That is easy. But then when we try uh, start comparing ourselves with each other, then that's kind of more difficult, I think. It's also very easy to say who we are if we compare ourselves with the United States, for example. Uh, for example, I think all Baltic states and all Nordic countries have uh, much in common. In, for example, uh, we are all in love with public transport. So in that way, it depends where you stand. Just like you said that who remembers is as well important. Uh, so we definitely are all interested, at least uh, to some point, about 
um, climate issues compared to Americans, compared to Russians, maybe also compared to other Europeans as well? Somebody else? Okay. <laughs> I think a lot, actually, when you look at the history of the 20th century, um, you know, national independence in the wake of the First World War, right? Soviet aggression, I mentioned, an occupation, complex relations with Nazi Germany, right? Sometimes more complex than, you know, we, we kind of, uh, um, that we... Um, uh, you know, that we tend to, to understand, right? The issues of collaboration and victimization, the scope, the forms of collaboration, also with the USSR, you know, some of these forms, they still, you know, they're still um, present in, in many ways, I guess, practices. Then mass population displacement, we heard about Karelia, right? Um, then social economic modernization and also uh, women's equality movement, right? And Finland is, is a leader here. Also, before the event, me and Ulla talked and we figured out that even the history of our institutions, for example, the Institution for Studying Folklore, you know, which were formed as part of the national movement. So a lot. I think sometimes we kind of tend not to, uh, not to appreciate how much we actually share, but maybe you would like to. Yes, uh, yes, I, I, I completely agree with uh, with both of the panelists, and and I see lots of uh, things that that Finland and Baltic countries share uh, in their 20th century history. But there are also differences. I think I think the 20th century history has also kind of um, uh, molded the the collective. Uh, memory, uh, national memory in Finland and in Baltic countries, somewhat different, as somewhat different. So, so there are not only kind of commonalities, but there are also differences. Um, uh, also, I think that um, most likely Finland and Baltic countries they share some kind of um, common identity within the EU. As, as sort of uh, somehow uh, countries uh, located in border areas and not at the center of Europe. And that, that also kind of creates commonalities and, and shared aspects, aspects and shared experiences uh, today. And speaking about these commonalities, uh, in your opinion, is a common policy for the assessment of historical memory in the EU countries, an aspiration for a, or a necessity. Should we have this common policy on, on memory? It's a very difficult thing, but uh, what, can, what can you say about that? Uh, should I start? Yes, uh, thank you for the question. Um, uh, Based on research, common policies of memory and, and memory laws uh, in general, they have been considered quite problematic in, in many ways. Uh, uh, for me, as a, as a researcher of culture, I, I kind of, uh, I'm, I'm quite hesitant of saying whether we should do something or not. I can only say that these um, kind of uh, very top-down um, efforts of creating um, unified memory or joint memory, they have um, been quite problematic and they have also had problematic kind of um, consequences um, uh, when they, uh, these kinds of um, efforts have been done. So um, I would say that uh, if there are common kind of um, efforts to, to have a unified or joint memory, uh, it should be done in a way that it kind of allows different versatile perspectives to the past. I think that always when we are dictating how to remember, it's, it's, it, it can be quite counterproductive of what uh, we aim to do. Um, this is a very complicated uh, topic. At the same time, I, I, I'm, I'm not for state memory at, at all. Uh, and Yet, at the same time, thinking of the history of Baltic states and how 
our right to write our own history has been targeted all the time for the past 20 years. And actually, nobody in Western European countries hasn't been very much interested in that at all. Not in Finland either, not in other Nordic countries. It has been considered like something very regional. Uh, nobody even... Uh, in Finland, I remember the Prone Soldier uh, crisis very well, and that was covered in Finnish media. But when I think about, you know, the, uh, the disinformation campaigns against Latvia and Lithuania, prior to that, then they were not covered in Finnish media at all. Nobody simply cared. So it is very beautiful to talk about the unity, and, and I'm sure we are united in many ways. But at the same time, I really do not like the idea of Finland whitewashing, actually, their own reactions. Finland did consider it a very much regional matter, and it's, it wasn't until Ukraine was un, under fire that certainly it was not considered regional anymore. So I think this is very important to remember because when I think about all Baltic states, how their right was questioned, then this is something I don't think we want to see that happening again. So in that way, and when I think about, let's say, Russian Federation's constitution, um, which, um, makes actually us all criminal in, uh, in the eyes of uh, Russia's uh, constitution. We are all criminals, what we are saying here now. So we ne really need to um, uh, support those who actually are researchers and journalists, whoever talks about... Uh, this is not as much. I mean, Finland has had its share over the past few years, not for past decades, but for a few years, uh, about the uh, difficulties between how Russia understands Finland's history. But um, when you think about the smaller, uh, smaller countries who've had this, uh, we, we have been forced to defend our right to write the history all the time, then it would be lovely if we don't need to defend it all the time. And I think in, in, in this thing we do need some sort of legal um, support as well. Um, and if you think about how difficult it has been to get you united about the uh, commemorating the victims of communism, for example. It's been extremely difficult, painstakingly difficult. And now we think about uh, Putinists rallying around Germany and in Berlin uh, yelling that we shall repeat it. We are coming back. Now, why is that actually allowed? That is, wh or why they are actually allowing. I support the freedom of expression. At the same time, it is a good question to ask, why is that really necessary? Is it really necessary? Is it really, really necessary? And uh, are, we uh, are we supposed to consider it like a free expression or Russia's representatives we cannot of course we cannot you know track down every single person if they have a connection with whatever russian embassy represents they might we cannot uh, explore that but uh, my point is that um a memory law should be in to protect uh, the memory of those who have been under oppression because usually those are the ones who lose the battle if there is a stronger opponent. Maybe somebody would want to react. Yeah, I, uh, I agree with a lot what has been said. It's certainly a complex issue, you know, with the regulation of memory from top down. And I, I think there is a great risk if there is, you know, something like memory policy from top down really following the path of Russia. Um, kind of seamlessly, step by step. So it is, it is an undesirable path. So I think 
one really should focus on building resilience, you know, on citizens' resilience to the, to the, you know, social resilience to propaganda ability um, of, you know, a kind of being able to tell falsehoods from from lies, from um, you know, from facts. Uh, this is elementary, right? This is repeated all the time. The trick is how to do it, how to build this critical reflection, this ability. I think perhaps in two ways, I was kind of thinking about it. Um, um, so first of all, respecting in any historical discourse about any event, respecting the professional standards and historical accuracy and talking about history, even the most uncomfortable, silenced, unpleasant parts with professionalism and honesty. And to me, this is, this is this courage that is necessary in everyone, a, a researcher, a you know, politician, always respecting historical accuracy no matter what. And, and to me, it is kind of the path to this, I don't know, strength, courage, and resilience. Maybe it sounds naive, but I genuinely believe in it, right? Um, another thing is uh, really to encourage, to find the ways to encourage a greater engagement of citizenry um, in contributing to the generation of historical narratives, precisely to encourage this you know, multiplicity, uh, you know, uh, the, this kind of, um, you know, multiplicity of, of, of memories, multiplicity of perspectives. I do believe in um, um, it, that it actually builds social resilience within the, no, within the community. Now, what to do, what you said about people, you know, running around and saying we are going to repeat it, or mojim pavterit, and so on, where the limits are, uh, you know, and at what point one should bring laws and regulations and, you know, criminal or other punishments. This is, a, this is a very, very tricky question. I'm not a legal person, and I, I, but that's, I just, yeah, it's, it's it, it kind of, it, it, you know, that this regulation, is, it has, sorry, significant dangers as well. But maybe, you know, someone has some. Uh, well, uh, actually, the resilience is, is an excellent uh, idea. The problem is how to build it. And you were talking about the accuracy, but I'm afraid common people don't care about the accuracy that much. How they, to make them? Uh, that's easy. <laughs> them. Uh, give them stories. <laughs> give them stories they want to, you know. We have actually here a Finnish publisher who, who has published uh, Toko Siltala, Vilna's Poker, just, you know, recently. We mm. don't have too many Lithuanian translations, that's for example. We don't have... I mean, when you think about a uh, relationship between Estonia and Finland, it is beautiful that Finns are more interested in Estonia's culture nowadays. They might even go to the opera festival. But in reality, uh, most of Finns go to Estonia to for something else, actually, than, you know, culture. Um, so, on the other hand, we do have so many workers now in Finland. Uh, all, you know, bolts are good immigrants in Finland. They are all welcome in that way, and maybe they want to share their stories. So, but the question about the resilience is like um, how to get the common ground. Let's let's see um, why we have a very united uh, opinion about the importance of Holocaust. We have the united understanding about the Holocaust simply because of movies because of books. It's not actually because of research and the accuracy, to but be honest. It really, I mean, we, of course, all the movie makers mm -hmm. and all the writers, they need the research, definitely. But it is because of the stories that are interesting enough for the broader audience. And you, if you think about the number of books about uh, Hilda's Germany, printed out in Finland every single year, it's quite high. And at the same time, if you think about the number of titles published about, let's say, gulags, which is actually, uh, should be more living memory to Finns, because there were more Finns perished in gulag than actually in Holocaust. So it is much more personal if you think about family stories. But actually, the number of 
is, well, there might be one, maybe two, or maybe zero. So in that way, uh, there is, it does make the difference. Uh, we had the first uh, uh, book in Finnish about Holodomor in 2018. And by the way, published again by <laughs> the man sitting there, Siltala. <laughs> uh, but uh, and because we got the first book about Holodomor in 2018, uh, it was last year when I met. I'm not going to say a name, but a Finnish journalist who is actually also reading our news, who told me that she hadn't ever heard about it, and that was last last year. So. Well, why she hadn't ever heard about the Holodomor, and she was shocked. I am happy that she knows now, but I mean, it's not actually normal that it took that long for a Finnish news reporter to understand or hear first time Holodomor. It shouldn't be possible, but it is possible because we are lacking simply titles. We are lacking movies. Hollywood isn't exactly interested in what's happening in this part of the world, to be honest. And they are not going to send their crews to Siberia. And I don't think they, at least not for now, they wouldn't. I'm sorry that HBO Nordic is not active anymore. It should be. So in that way, um, the lack of stories, and that again means the lack of money, the lack of investments, because making a movie requires money. Translating books requires money. It is a question of political will. I, If I may respond, well, I hope you will forgive me for responding. I agree with a lot of what you said. Um, except I would say that the agreement regarding the Holocaust is, is not so unanimous, certainly not, um, you know. There it's is considered bad, you know, that is already something that is united. Y there is an understanding of it was wrong. Right, right. And there I is I a question that. about that mm -hmm. it's, it was a genocide, then, you know, mm -hmm. if you go, what I mean, I'm, I'm sure that there are a lot of things that we can say about different interpretations about the Holocaust, but if you go now to down, down here, and you ask whoever person comes, you know, it doesn't matter the age or the uh, gender or the in level of income, they all know Holocaust, unlike obviously Holodomor, for example. They all know Holocaust, it's a word they know. They know that it was against Jews, at least. Maybe all do not know that it was also against um, queer people, but at least Jews, they know that. Uh, we have a common understanding that Jews were targeted, not like in Soviet Union, where there was no common understanding. <laughs> they, they didn't think about Jews at all. So in that way, we have actually surprisingly quite many things that we have a united opinion about. Uh, and genocide, for example. So what I mean is that I know that researchers think a bit differently, but those common people, you know, walking in downtown, those are the ones who vote. Mm. Uh, just a quick response to that. Well, that is in Finland, yeah, but they remark that, for example, in the States, actually, a lot of people do not know what the Holocaust is already, so I guess, uh, you know, statistically, this is the case. But I would like to say very quickly... And in Russia, the there are so many people who do not uh, recognize Absolutely Gulag, true, which true, is, true. this is all very sad, but I mean, true. if you think about all different, uh, let's say, genocide words, that Holocaust is the most known. True, but what you said about deportations and about Holodomor, it's absolutely true. Now, going to deportations, and let's say deportations as a Finnish experience, reading the memoirs of deportees, Lithuanians, Latvian deportees, Finns are there, actually. You know, they said they went in Trafimovsk or somewhere else near Laptev Sea, people who were there or were there a bit before were Finns. So actually, in these sources, the, the stories, the reference to these people are there. So now you made me thinking, okay, so what happened to our stories? You said now, now you know, Gavalis was translated. This is great, fabulous, but like, what happened to our stories? Why does it take so long for us to learn something about each other in general, maybe even with such close geographic maybe proximity? We need that, maybe we need <laughs> that policy, that common policy. Uh, we, we need money. We, simply we need, need money. We need yeah. money. To you know, we're sitting next to a film museum here. So uh, basically, uh, do we have enough uh, film directors 
trying to make a watchable film, a watchable, interesting film about issues we talk about. And I want to, I want to ask Ola here, uh, what is your experience in, in analyzing oral history, and, and, and this, this is what we are talking about here, of how much and why people do not know? And why, in your opinion, people sometimes do not care to know, or maybe even blocking themselves from knowing? Uh, Yes, that's a that's good question, and, and, and about the Finnish deportees uh, who were deported. Um, I, would, I would say that most of them were Ingrian Finns, who used to live in, in around the villages around the city of St. Petersburg, this old historical community, and I have been researching memories and testimonies and, and memoirs of these people. And, and I, I, I completely agree that there is a lack of information in Finland on the experiences of these people, even though they have been publishing their memoirs and testimonies since the 1930s in Finland. But I think that it's also a point of, of kind of um, critical self-reflection. What kind of people we accept as, as Finns? What kind of experiences we do accept as part of... of, of uh, Finnish uh, collective memory or national memory, because in the case of these Ingrian Finns, I, I would say that one issue has been that they they are not they have not been considered as Finn enough and, and Finnish enough to be included that that their stories would be included within the kind of Finnish historical uh, consciousness, and and even now I would say even though there are more and more representations available, more and more research available, it is still not part of the, the kind of uh, popular memory of, of all the people out there who know their stories and, and, and who know what happened to them. And my answer again is the same as before, literature, movies. Yeah. Uh, because you know the Karelians, they are part of Finnish literature, so clearly. Uh, thanks a lot to, to Laira Hirvisaari, who just recently passed. I mean, she was uh, a displaced child herself, and uh, her books were so popular in Finland that they sold over four million copies here. Uh, and she wasn't the only one, and now actually the second and third generation of those families who had to flee and leave their homes, they are now writing their stories. But the Ingrian Finns, uh, when they write memoirs, they are usually published by uh, small, they are self-published or by small companies. So they are, it's important, of course, that they write their memoirs, but they don't, they are not part of common understanding of our history. And then again, Sometimes you need only one. They miss. They don't have the Laila Hirvasari who would, you know, make it uh, accessible and available for every single person. Simply. Do we have questions from the audience? Yes, we do have one question. So maybe I will. Thank you. Eero Hakamies is my name, and uh, I'm listening to your most interesting discussion about identities. Actions uh, connecting our countries. I, my small little um, private memory, if you let me uh, bring it here now, is that my mother, 1930s, uh, to, to, uh, was a student uh, who participated in um, different uh, celebrations of Baltic countries, visiting Finland, and Finland visiting. Uh, those countries, listening to authors, poets, musicians, squires. That was a cultural exchange for youngsters. And only th sad thing is that uh, the war broke this all. Uh, and after the war, my mother told that, uh, don't you children ever think that uh, our Baltic neighbors uh, could forget anything about their history. And uh, she was most happy when Baltic countries received their independence together. And uh, the thing was that, to, that, what I understood, we were small countries getting our independence after the Russian Revolution. There were, we were small countries Something at the Baltic Sea combined us, 
Pr probably we had some culture in common as well. And uh, this thing, this, this exchange uh, could be uh, cut off for a while. And now I'm very happy to hear that we are having something uh, in common together now. And what, what I would add finally is that I read uh, a book of Svetlana Alexievich, a uh, Belarusian, uh, who told that Russian authors, they have a uh, association. They have written three letters to Kremlin uh, in order to claim that if history is not uh, be written uh, to the audience, to the public who have uh, suffered so much. It is afraid that these things could repeat time and time again. So the trouble of the authors was real yeah. and what we see now. Uh, excuse me that I interrupted you, but uh, these small memories I, I would like to bring here as well. Thank you. Thank you. And Sophie was blaming, and me, film industry. Uh, film industry, yes, uh, it is anyway. And, uh, it is the most accessible yeah. way to convey and, and publishing in history a way. and publishing. Could we, could we blame? Well, actually, they, they, are, they go nowadays kind of hand in hand because most of the TV shows and movies are actually yeah. based on, yeah. on books. But could we blame academia for that? Who could, a, well, who could answer why? this question? <laughs> okay, Ula, do you want to? Uh, uh, well, I could say that I, I, I completely agree on the kind of uh, mnemonic uh, kind of uh, effectivity of film and, and art. It, it, it certainly has it, uh, film, especially uh, Hollywood film, uh, they're kind of... Um, uh, the way that they can can kind of um, uh, raise awareness of certain topics, it's undeniable. Uh, memory scholars have theorized, uh, on the other hand, that even though uh, films, for example, or these very popular narratives, they can uh, increase people's awareness of, of these events, they tend at the same time kind of um, uh, create certain kinds of templates for the remembrance and, and perhaps in the long run they not necessarily promote the kind of plurality of, of memories and the awareness of different kinds of, of perspectives but they can turn kind of create these these very uh, sometimes rigid templates for remembrance and, and kind of uh, that are repeated a uh, time after time. Yeah, it's, but it, it's the same with everything. Uh, but at the same time, you know, the more you have movies, the more you have narrations, the more you have kind of those templates. So it's not, you know, the, um, Chimamanda Adichie uh, has talked about the danger of a single story. I mean, that way, that is, of course, the, uh, the problem. And that's why one title is not enough. One movie is not enough. One TV show is not enough. You need to have the sea of them, and mm -hmm. again, then we go back to the money. But the thing is that you know, the, the, when you think about uh, the tradition of uh, Holocaust movies, then it was quite often that uh, those who went to the states, the movie makers, they had Holocaust survivors in the family. Uh, they might have lost the whole family themselves, but naturally, you know, there were there are not that many, that many. Uh, then from the eastern side. And Hollywood is about drama always, which works well, but academia should be about some other things. Uh, okay. Isn't it? You can talk about uh, yeah. Yeah, it. Yeah, I can <laughs> contribute to this. Yeah, yeah, <laughs> I can see that it, it, it's part Do of... Do we have influential academicians <laughs> who can speak to broader uh, audiences? Uh, uh, I think that... Uh, sorry. Do you want to go ahead? Yeah, sure. So I will contribute. Yeah, yeah. I I think that there definitely are are influential academy uh, academics, but I think that it's it's part also um, partly a matter of of division of labor. I think that the duty of academics is first of all to to kind of analyze and to 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 look critically the 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 representations that we have and and to kind of look into the processes of circulation and and what kind of um, 
uh, how come some some movies and books, for example, become influential and why others do not? So, so I think it's it's partly that the role of academics, of course, it's an important uh, to to kind of uh, tell about your research and 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 tell about these kind of historical facts. But still, I think that they're kind of the most important duty of academics is to, to be critical and to an analyze the culture as it is going on and also historical uh, issues. If I make now kind of reshape the question, I do not need necessarily to search for one particular group to blame, right? <laughs> be it filmmakers or academics. I'm thinking, painting a picture think, here. I understand, but I will bring it maybe another way. For example, thinking about Lithuanian context. Yes, films have been made about the experience. It's not the experience of deportation or even anti-Soviet partisan movement was silenced in, in, um, um, in Lithuanian context. Yes, the industry was undefended. There was, you know, lack of resources. Resources. But at the same time, I think there is another aspect there, and I would like to go back to these Finns that Lithuanian deportees are writing about. These are in memoirs, in these memoirs and their testimonies, Finns are there, as well as Ukrainians are there, as well as some of the local indigenous peoples are there, and even Russians, I'm sorry, who were deported, you know, like after, you know, by the Tsar, even those are there, right? But then when this travels when it's mediated by the by the by the by film by the cinema very often one sees the focus on oneself and i think it has been proven many times that the communities that seen themselves as victimized you know kind of tend to concentrate on one on themselves and this is natural right but at some point i guess there comes a stage where you see those fans there and you include their stories in a way in your own national narrative if you will or in your own account of the experience and that's why i guess uh, you know i kind of argue, as many scholars argue, to also overcome, you know, the parochialism in a way that, you know, in historical research, when perspective, because that does help to build solidarity, right? Now, now about academia, you know, in Lithuania, I hear that, oh, you know, you scholars, you got to go now and, and, and talk to the public. You guys are to blame because people don't know historical facts or you are not making films. As Zula said, everybody, you know, does his or her job. You know, we have a writer with us, you know, like people are academics, they're very frequently invisible, but that's but, but you know, the knowledge, the information, if it's done well, professional, it's out there. If one wants to stick to historical facts, one cannot make a step without doing research and understanding what's out there, unless you want to make some sort of, you know, uh, a tale that is, you know, appealing, effective, as Timothy Snyder said in, you know, there is this article called Commemorative Causality that I like, and, you know, then history becomes this kind of wishy-washy, you know, tail basically about whatever is most effective and can be appealing to the audience. Where is history there? It always has to go back to, to you know, to historical accuracy and to the truth that has to be a foundational ethical base from where everything is starting, no? And my job as a journalist now is to ask whether there are questions from the audience. Yes. Um, thank you very much. My, my name is Andreas Herdiner. I grew up in Austria, but I haven't lived there for the last 36 years. I, I can only half agree with what Sophie uh, Oxenen has been saying, because it sounded to me as if you were saying the voices from the Baltic states were ignored by the West. And when I grew up, I mean, I was always aware that, for instance, Ukrainian was an official language in the old Austria. It was one of the languages on the, on the paper money of the old Austria until 1918. I was aware of the Iron Curtain. I was aware of the refugees that came from Czechoslovakia in 1968, from Hungary in 1956. I saw them myself when I'd have maneuvers as a reservist in the army. The enemy was always the enemy, red enemy coming from the east. So. Is it not more the question, not that the Baltic remembrance was ignored, 
but that the conclusions drawn were different, that the Baltic states remained aware that even after the end of the Cold War, the Russian threat might revise itself, particularly now in this fascist imperialist way, whereas in other countries the conclusion was um, one can engage and bring Russia into the fold, etc. That's the one question I have. The other question... May, may, may I, you know, stop and then you can continue, okay. but it's yeah. easier to remember one question at the time than all. Um, yeah, I'm, I'm happy that y y you are, y your family background and, and your li living surrounding has made it possible that you are aware of Bolts and Ukrainians and what's happening behind the Iron Curtain. Um, um, this is oh, not from Austria, but quite often I meet, let's say, Finnish estophiles who all also tried to tell me that we Finns knew everything about what was happening behind the Iron Curtain. Yes, uh, we were very sorry for Estonia. Um, this is actually the, you know, if a person has knowledge of deportations and the Second World War, what it meant to occupy territories, they usually, I'm, I'm happy that they are aware of it, but it feels like that they think that their, their knowledge and their remembrance is actually reflecting the whole Europe or the whole Western Europe. And at the same time, when there is this Finnish estophile who has been trying to smuggle manuscripts from Soviet Estonia to Finland, at the same time, where, when, if every single Finn was like that, then how on earth, in 2003, when my first novel came out in Finnish, 2003, I met people... <laughs> I mean, this is, is it, it is a joke in uh, in Baltic states, so it's kind of weird to actually live the joke. You know the joke that every Lithuanian, Estonian, Latvian, quite many other nationalities also know that know the question about why didn't you call the police when they came for you? So okay, somebody came to deport you. Why didn't you call the police? This is actually a real question I got in 2003. So, okay, when, when I told a Finnish journalist about deportations, which is, I am writing about them in Stalin's cows. So, wh why didn't you call for help? Why didn't you, you know, SOS? So, why didn't you do that? And then the question, so, what, uh, so the question that some, not all, some, Finnish journalists just couldn't understand why Soviet newspapers didn't write about deportations if they took place. If they took place, as you claim, as I, I was claiming. So, you know, at the same time, we did have those estophiles who, who were very much aware of things happening, who even learned Finn Estonian language. At the same time, these were real people, real people, and their knowledge was that they didn't really understand why on earth the Soviet newspapers didn't write about deportations if the deportation took place, as I claimed. Or they were actually sure, you know, people of my age, people of older generation, they were sure that Estonians, like Lithuanians, Latvians could compensate it when, uh, when their, uh, their homes were taken in, uh, into a collective farms. These are real people, the real questions. So uh, again, like, you know, I'm, I'm happy that, that you, you are much more aware than many others, but it is like there is a huge range of different level of knowledge. And, and even though, you know, I might say, oh, this is a common, I'm, I'm sure, as, as you said, that I am saying, yes, everybody knows the Holocaust, but I, I know that unfortunately it is not true. Uh, so in that way, this is also that we are so sure about that our historical experience is what reflects the whole country and the whole nation and everything. Then I'm, I'm, I'm afraid we always have to rethink. Um, thanks. Then I'll bring my second question, but you've raised a third one. Is it not a generational question? Because, I mean, in my generation, we grew up 
as the children who were much influenced by the Nazi times, we knew how people were taken from the streets, etc. And in Eastern Austria, where the Soviet occupation, people were taken from the streets and also taken to the gulag. That still somehow in my generation. So my question is, is it a generational ignorance or is it a general one? And then is it not also a question of remembrance of small countries? How many Finns know about the history of Slovenia, of Belgium, even Greece, post uh, interwar history of Austria? Um, is it just not that the Baltics are also small and therefore the history is less known, um, just like the Slovene history is less known? It's probably a question to Sophie, but I could try to answer it from a different angle, because if it's okay. If it's okay. Yeah, so uh, I think your question uh, reminded me of what I see. In, I'm teaching at Vilnius University, and I have an international group of students. So I have people from Portugal, from Spain, from Austria, from uh, Italy, uh, Germany, and so on. And uh, I have to say that, in general, Europeans know very little about each other's history. Uh, even less they know about very clear parallels in the history. I could say that uh, whether it's a generational thing or not, I would not really be able to reflect on that. I mean, you know, I'm sure, you know, people of older generation, they have more personal, personalized memories that have to do with the, you know, Nazi, Nazi regime and so on. So, but for the younger generation, sometimes one could think that these, that these young guys, they live on different planets, like it's an archipelago. A and this is a small continent, right? So it's, a, it's I think, a general phenomenon. Uh, you know, we uh, Europeans know extremely little about each other. And um, yeah, a crisis of history or something, where there are ever better times, I don't know. But I think it's a problem for, for, for Europe, you know? It's, um, it's all very close. I think now we realize how close things are. I, I was, you know, I, I, I lived in Kiev, in Ukraine, for, for, for almost two years. I mean, this turn, circum family circumstances turned out that way. And uh, I was surprised myself that from Vilnius airport to, uh, to Giuliani that was bombed now, it takes basically, um, it's about an hour. And sometimes you can get stuck in the traffic somewhere in Kiev or somewhere else for longer than actually to fly. Then you kind of with your body realize how close this is. So yeah, Europeans in general know very little about each other, certainly young Europeans. There are enormous gaps. Um, why that is, I don't think I'm fully competent to answer. I, I think it's quite often, you know, the old um, old question, all the old anecdote. I, nowadays, I always go back to old anecdotes. Tell me what you uh, what you think about Solzhenitsyn, and I'll tell you a family story. You know, this old anecdote. I think it is it's valid even today, even in in a way that what you know about the history of of, of, of Europe or the Second World War, then it's very much about your own family background, uh, your own family story, stories that matter have mattered to you. You think that they are important enough, but when you think about um, how little uh, Europe in general knows about Russia, uh, then it is surprising. It is surprising. I'll give you an example. Uh, when I think about my translations, I naturally, if the context requires, I use the phrase Great Patriotic War. Because if the person is going to use it, I cannot certainly decide that the Russian person is saying in the Second World War. And in all Eastern European translations, Baltic states, it's not a problem at all. But then you, if it's not actually a um, problem, well, I'm not going to make an analysis is in, in which languages it is a problem, but in certain territory, language territories, it is a problem. Because the publisher thinks that this is simply not understandable expression to 
a local reader. And we, I'm talking about Europeans. If Europeans do not know what, the great, what kind of myth of the Great Patriotic War is, then simply we have trouble understanding what's happening in, in Russia. And uh, I would like to add that even in our countries, people are still surprised to know things, and, and maybe this is also I important to understand. Uh, I'll give uh, you the, the, the opportunity to, to answer, but to, to, to ask, but uh, I'm looking at, at, at a Latvian scholar, and Edwin Schnore, the Latvian documentary um, director, has made this documentary called Soviet Story. And it was very, uh, very popular in, in our countries, but I met lots and lots of people in Lithuania who were surprised to know about Stalin's crimes. And could you please, uh, you are listening to our discussion, and I would like to give you an opportunity to react. Maybe you have some, some opinions to express. Yeah, thank you very much. Um, no, that's a great discussion. Um, um, I have many, many things that I could add to this, what was said. Um, probably I think what is the most interesting thing for me is this connection between academia and the wider world. Um, the reasons why um, why all the research we are doing it's not it, it it's not transmitted to the actual world. Uh, why do we stay in our um, in our bubble? Even though there is in every grant application, we have to explain how we are going to secure the outreach to the wider public, and still it is problematic. But I think, and we, I think we as academics, we can be blamed for that. Um, maybe we don't do it enough. Maybe we don't try to 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 tell the stories that we are writing about in a simpler way. Sometimes academic texts are quite difficult to uh, to access. But I think it's also the the wider problem of our times that people um, are used to being fed like very uh, quick stories. Even to read a book these days, it's something that not everybody takes this effort. Uh, to read a book of fiction is one thing, but then to read an academic text, it's another thing. But people are used to these very short, entertaining stories that sometimes last three minutes on TikTok. So I think it's also a question of how can we catch the attention and how can we make people to, to really focus on something longer that is not always entertaining, that takes patience. Um, yeah, that's probably one thing that I wanted to share. I, I would like to 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 comment uh, the academia in general. I, I think that one of the problems. I mean, you are talking about you know the work and the facts, but not the human factor. The human factor. What I what I mean is and and the money. You know, academia is lacking money. I'm sure that you could do wonders if you had more money. Uh, some uh, fields uh, are sexier than others. Also, money wise. Um, that is something one one encounters also as a, as a, as a author. If you try to look for something, then certainly there's so much uh, everything about a certain field or a subject matter, and then there's total silence elsewhere. Uh, but but also because there's not much money, um, and there's uh, you know the space and the posts are numbered, then I feel that scholars try to, to I'm, I'm sure that there's a feeling of, of um, solidarity as well, but if, if there's a scholar that certainly, you know, gets a wider readership or public or popular, you know, publicity, then there's always a scholar who tries to tear them down, you know, that you shouldn't be there, you know, you shouldn't be, you shouldn't be that public, you shouldn't be, you know, that popular. There's always someone, uh, if it's a woman, but also Timothy Schneiser is also probably too popular, uh, you know, uh, um, or many scholars think that he's too popular, he's too active, he's too something, because he is, he's an example of a, of a historian who has a why, who, who actually reaches out to people and makes very complicated things interesting. Uh, so I, I think, you know, the human factor is, is also, you know, people are jealous to each other, simply. Uh, and maybe we shouldn't underestimate, uh, in, in case of Timothy Snyder, uh, Russia's 
effort to discredit him. Uh, we have questions here. Yes, thank you, Jani Kokko, Member of Parliament. Uh, before, before I was elected in April, uh, I was a scholar at the Department of History and Ethnology at the University of Jyväskylä, so I can relate this lack of money, um, lack of money talk. Uh, but regarding that, my question is more about this historical representation. Uh, we have seen in the Baltic states that they are tearing down Russian and Soviet war memorials, uh, communist symbols. Uh, in Turku and Kotka have removed Lenin statues. Uh, in Helsinki they are planning to rename Lenin's Park for some, some other name. And my question is, uh, is, it, is this necessary? And are, or are we just uh, racing or redefining history? What, what is your commenting on that? Who would like to? Ritus, maybe. Ritus maybe. Oh, no. I'm <laughs> talking too much already. No, no, I think you're more in, in this. I, I, I'm, I'm, I can start, you'll continue. Um, I, I think when, when, when we had this world peace uh, monument, uh, in, in Kallio Hakaniemi, which was simply, you know, ridiculous that it existed. But um, but um, it could have existed if you have, like, something that tells the context. The problem is that if we have monuments without context uh, or uh, something that is representing... Uh, of course, at the same time, we could ask, the, the, so why, why we are not having... Uh, something, you know, praising Hitler. I mean, that would be fair if Soviet monuments are here as well. So that's another question. Uh, then again, if you think about Italy, then Mussolini's grave is actually rather popular, which I find very weird, but uh, it is. So, um, but, but I think, you know, the con understanding the context is the most important thing. And it's also important to understand that what the world has looked like, you know, during the previous years. Um, but if you don't understand the context, then that is a problem. Yeah, uh, I could not agree more. I think it's it's quite understandable reaction uh, uh, when the crisis comes that what is done to monuments. And then I, I think that... Uh, uh, it's uh, in addition to telling about certain historical time and historical context monuments in the public space they also have kind of this performative power they 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 might produce some um something else in the present and that's why i i i think that it's it's not easy solution to just to let's get rid of everything and, and but but I think I do think that monuments in public space they do not only represent the, the past context uh, during which they have been built but but in present they can can kind of produce something more and that's why it's it's very very important to to have this kind of contextualizing kind of uh, approach to to historical monuments whatever they are I think. And uh, uh, maybe I, I refer to the um, uh, museum in, in Kiev, which was called the Museum of Great, Great Patriotic War, and now it is, I cannot remember what is the official name. Aye. But anyway, it was changed after the de decommunication uh, uh, laws. Uh, so I've been to the before the revolution of dignity and after. Uh, and uh, it was interesting place, you know, before the revolution, because it was um, it was obviously a place where Russians were making new memories. They were. It was not a place. It was not a museum. It was a place where they were ma making new memories. There were, you know. Uh, newlywed couples taking their, uh, their wedding photos, children with grandmothers who pass on the, the memory of Great Patriotic War. It felt like I had traveled back in time to the Soviet Union. And there were so many people. I mean, it was extremely, uh, I mean, not the museum, museum itself, but you know, the whole area, because it's an open air, it's rather big, open air. Um, Place uh, and then 
after uh, when I went after the revolution, it was empty. All those people had actually disappeared. All those, you know, grandchildren and babushkas and newlyweds, they had disappeared. Um, so it had become a museum before it had been, you know, present day where you create new memories and after it had become a museum. And it wasn't, I mean, the statues were the same, mm -hmm. the tanks were the same, the museum was the same. So actually, you know, the, all those monuments existed on the same place they had been before. And I don't think it was only because of the, the, the uh, new law. It was because um, Putinists probably felt less empowered simply because it was obviously a place for empowering the connection with Russia. Um, there were less that. Probably some of them were, you know, coming tourists coming from other regions, probably as well. But it has, you know, it didn't even even though it was renamed, but it you didn't even, you know, underline the context. People had made the difference, simply. If I could add something. Um, so yeah, I very much agree with um, with the statement that context is everything. It's it's very true. Now regarding this, um, uh, these you know the monuments or whatever the other uh, forms of basically kind of purging the the space from the science of the past, you know the oppressive past. It's it's a complex issue in the sense that it brings us back to this question: What is the kind of right way of dealing with this oppressive past. What is past? What is the right form of, you know, to use the Vergangenheitsbewältigung, right? In German context, this famous, you know, process, right? What is the right way to deal with it? And sometimes we also have to take into consideration who and for what purpose is promoting some, some of these actions. Sometimes it happens in some context that the people who kind of should be reflecting their own history of collaboration are the first ones of kind of trying to, you know, to, to be the, you know, frontline activists and say, okay, let's clear these outer signs. But this is in a way sometimes a cover up for this you know, inner reflection, basically. So there is a lack of, I guess, you know, more in-depth reflection. What is basically the nomenclatura history of my own family? You know, like my, you know, this personal history, right? Like which, you know, in the German context appeared, you know, okay, I was a Nazi and this is why, right? You know, basically an attempt to engage with courage and honesty with your own story that's kind of is also lacking. And sometimes I think that this is, in some cases, this, this comes in handy, um, you know, when there is a lack of reflect of one's own personal continuities. You know, we talk about these institutional continuities that go from, you know, go for several decades. Well, there are things in families as well, you know, and, and, and yeah, some of these public actions sometimes is a cover up. It's a form of silence, so it could be a form of silence, you know. Okay, we have a question here. Yes, uh, thank you for a fascinating discussion. My name is Ruta Kozlovskaite. I'm a political scientist from the University of Helsinki. And just uh, listening to this latest part of your discussion, I was thinking how I walked yesterday in one of the main squares of Helsinki, and there's this um, Russian imperial bi-headed eagle. <laughs> Uh, and, and I witnessed a scene where it's being uh, cleaned and it's shining in the sun. And I, I won't lie, I, I re got uh, very ambivalent feelings looking at that scene in the current context. Uh, but over the years that I, I have lived in Helsinki, um, when I would have friends visiting me from Eastern Europe, they would all note these sculptures to the Tsar and uh, these symbols of the Russian Empire. And, and I, I think that's how I felt that somehow maybe our identity uh, uh, and the stories and the narratives we grew up uh, about the 20th century or, or earlier history are somehow different than, you know, that, that was an indicator how we are different perhaps from Finland. 
but my my original question was uh, thinking about these 20th century experiences. Uh, a lot of them are about victimizations um, of different groups. And I think I will just build up on something that has been mentioned here. Um, I mean, there is a lot of research coming from political psychology that shows that if you are really uh, putting so much emphasis uh, on these victimization stories to the extent that they become kind of the defining story of the nation, of the in-group, uh, it really correlates with uh, the rise of far-right movements, effective polarization, and all kinds of things that perhaps you don't want to uh, have in your society. So I'm just wondering, and I'm grappling with this question myself, how do we talk about these stories uh, of victimization of different groups uh, in, the, in the 20th century, but also before that, without getting stuck in this eternal identity of victimhood? How do we move uh, beyond that? Uh, author's uh, answer is, is always more definitions. I, I think a survivor is a great word, but we don't actually have exact equivalent in, in Finnish language. We can translate it, it but it's not it, it, it's not a word you would use in a spoken language, for example, that we kind of need. Uh, also, quite many victims don't I mean, they want to have other identities as well, not to be the victim for the rest of your life, simply considered only as a victim. Or Also, it's, it's a bit passive word. If you're an agent in, in, your, in your life, then victim is not a good word at all. So I usually try to avoid it. But um, then I face, uh, face the fact that, that there are only limited number of words I can use, otherwise I have to invent new words and I'm, 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 then it wouldn't be accessible. This, this is what the Lithuanian writer you were talking about and who is just translated into Finnish used to do. He was yeah. inventing words, special words yeah. for, for, for notions that were went there before maybe or went or went uh, the, those notions weren't realized. Uh, any, any more questions? Yeah. Okay. I would like to know uh, what does it mean Eastern Europe? To be more precise, what the, what do you mean by Eastern Europe? That's only what was my question to the lady who asked something. This is the this. endless question. <laughs> <laughs> I leave it to researchers. I, I leave it to the researchers. I'll, I'll give that to the lady. And <laughs> Yeah, one more question from here. Thank you very much for an interesting uh, discussion. Uh, my name is Heta Hedman and I come from an NGO, Finnish NGO called Historians Without Borders. And um, one of our aims is to bring the knowledge of historians to conflict resolution and peace building processes. And for some time we've been engaging in history dialogues, which means dialogues of historians from various countries. And now in the fall we will be uh, organizing together with the University of Tallinn a history dialogue for Finnish and Estonian historians, uh, specifically about 20th century uh, history and, and more precisely about historiography and memory politics, what are the similarities and what are the differences in our countries. Because especially as Sophie Oxanen mentioned, especially Finnish historians have written somewhat on Estonian history, but Estonian historians have not written so much in Finnish history. And this is also a very interesting kind of tension to discuss. So one of our aims uh, is, as I said, to recognize these, these tendencies and then also kind of um, recognize uh, areas for future research on these topics, identify those things. So it's, uh, as someone mentioned here, it would be interesting to get historians more uh, kind of into these discussions on the historiography. And uh, with, the with the dialogues that we have been organizing, our one aim is also that through the dialogue that you have with historians from another nationality, you're also able to identify and maybe a little bit deconstruct these very nation-centered narratives that you have of your own country of your own past. So this is maybe one tool that could 
hopefully be more broadened in the future as well to get historians more engaged themselves into these discussions. Thank you. I think this was also just partially an answer to, to Ruta's question, which is very good and very complex. How to get basically out of, you know, parochialism of sorts, right? If, um, you know, this, this um, kind of, um, you know, centering on oneself. Um, it's, it's complicated, especially when we are, you know, telling these kind of narratives of suffering and pain and so on. But... Uh, I guess that would be the the you know the the only way like for you know for some let's say Lithuanian writer to come out and write about those things uh, also and about those you know whoever they were in you know in the gulag with right somehow you know to yeah. one more question here thank you the lady in the right on the right of me uh, spoke uh, about the double-headed eagle in the square uh, that is an interesting question. When the church is divided, when the Roman Catholic um, Rome uh, departed from Constantinople in 1054, uh, Constantinople took the symbol uh, of double-headed uh, eagle. Now, when Moscow, 15 or so, uh, at the end of 14 and something, uh, took the power and felt the power, felt the world power. They took the symbol from Constantinople in order to play the role of third Rome. Uh, there was not a, there is not a third Rome, but there is not a first Rome. There is a Rome and there is new, new Rome. And Moscow was ac actually not officially accepted to take this third Rome role, but this is not out. This is out of the discussion today. Thank you. Uh, could I just briefly con continue with your your comment? Uh, uh, in my field, in memory studies, the uh, the, uh, the kind of the most central uh, topic of self-critique uh, during the last years have related to this kind of focus on on, on uh, victimization and on, and the kind of focusing on trauma and, and violent histories that has been the main issue lately. And and as I see it, I I think that uh, one important um, way is to kind of um, accept the multiple and multi-scalar uh, uh, kind of levels of implication and, 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 um, and, and complicities that are always uh, involved with uh, in, in history and, and related to this, that we are not just victims or, or perpetrators, but, but most likely people are kind of um, implicated in, in these violent and, and horrible processes in, in multi multiple ways. And I think that paying attention to, to these kind of gray areas is very important, and also allowing multiple perspectives and voices to, to historical events. I think that's that's crucially important, and I think that um, research, of course, but also art and, and literature pay, plays a central role in, in kind of bringing up these kinds of narratives as well. Uh, well, Sufi tells stories of empowerment. I remember the end of Page, and you know, that's is these are yeah, that's it's. I, I find these um, you know, these are tales of empowerment, not um, not um, you know, not kind of only victimhood or from you know what could be a victim. You go to someone that has an agency that. So, yeah. yeah, stories of resistance and protest, yes, and, and yeah. I think those are... Yeah, and I, I al always see all my characters as survivors. I think they are like that. And what kind of always surprises me that one of the most common questions um, for me is that, um, or that my, my characters are defined as strong women, which I find kind of weird. Uh, because w what what does it mean? Like you know, uh, if my characters are strong, then does it mean that the most of the women in literature are weak, or what? I usually reply that youths only say this because I give enough pages for the for the women, you know. Because um, if you give women enough dialogue on screen or enough pages in a book, then you know then. 
they have more space, they become like, you know, round characters. It's only a matter of number of characters. And then you, you, you certainly have this image of strong women, but I, I don't really understand it. I think it is actually tells something about the world um, um, and not in, in, in a good way. I think you might have even said as well that you have strong women. I mean, what are then the weak women in the literature? Answer to me to that. Weak women. Weak women, in because the if, 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 if yeah, because if if I have strong characters, you then should that read. Means that you should read Dostoevsky. Then you will have weak okay, women in literature. Okay, but if we talk literature. about contemporary, 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 contemporary literature, as and and as a minority among strong women uh, i have to now i have to say that we are moving towards the finish of uh, uh, sorry for the pun uh, of our discussion which is uh, was very interesting and um, i would like to maybe we could we could um, bring out uh, several things which really unite us in terms of being common grounds we started from common grounds in a way and would you agree that uh, Besides everything, our countries uh, still have one existential problem, that is Russia. Would you agree? Yes, I do. And second, that we are all resilient enough, and resilient enough, are we? I hope so. I, I have faith in people, I don't know. <laughs> Such big words, I, I still have to <laughs> respond. And the third thing I think that is that we are still and, and, and hopefully very honest about complexity of everything we live in and with. Would you agree to this? And since we are graciously hosted by, um, by the um, European Commission's and Lithuanian and embassy. Yes. So I think we, we, we are European, right? We <laughs> and so if we are, you know, we, we, we have to deal with the, with, the, you know, with the issues that are very, very close to us, you know, on the you know, continent, as you said, also, you know, ecological issues, the issues of, you know, education, the issues of scholarship, the issues of academic, pr I mean, art, uh, you know, artistic production and so on. So multiple, multiple, multiple issues. It's, it would be very hard to come up with one slogan. It's just multiple ties. <laughs> and I would hope that the, the kind of project uh, that we we shouldn't think that, okay, we are done. We are now, now perfect and, and we are very self critical and everything but the kind of project should continue always so so we find kind of um, new topics and and we can reflect our position in Europe in a new way and continue to do that also in the future struggle for democracy rule of law human rights I mean the usual right <laughs> I guess that's why we all are here <laughs> and congratulations to Finland in joining the NATO uh, Violeta Davoliute, uh, Ula Savalainen, and Sofia Oksanen. I was Rita Zamkowskas. Thank you very much. Thank you for this wonderful discussion. Let's stay in touch. <laughs>